okay let's begin today's lecture okay let me continue with applications of industrial ways the sub topics of today's lecture are application of industrial waste or the by products as i said in the previous lecture that nowadays we do not term industrial waste as such is it not we say that these are by products and then we have to utilize them because the whole intention is to recover precious things out of the waste so no more the waste which is or which was being termed as waste is waste nowadays here we have discussed in details application of fly ash a very common industrial by product which comes out of thermal plant the silica fumes in the previous lecture i had asked you what is silica fumes the rubber tires we were talking about in the last lecture glass aggregates and dredge material and i will try to emphasize here that uh, why characterization of these by products is a must what are the issues involved in uh, this whole study the first is, is issue is that you have to identify the application then what are the properties which are required for application then comes environmental sustainability followed by some protocols which are developed in laboratory by testing the material now testing of the material and creating the guidelines is nothing but the protocols and then modeling of engineering behavior of these materials then constructability and field performance of the material and ultimately what is the long term performance and the most important issue here is that whatever you are doing should be following the regulatory constraints what is meant by regulatory constraints that your activity should be within the permissible limits of the values which are not going to toxicate the environment and so on so these are the steps which are important when we talk about the major issues or the you know the questions which are bothering everybody what is the application for which you require a material or a by product that is the number one then what are the properties associated with it then whether it is sustainable or not environmentally what type of test should be done and by conducting these tests what type of protocols we are going to develop these protocols are nothing but the guidelines code of conduct then modeling of engineering behavior of these materials constructability and field performance how do they perform their long term performance and ultimately we keep in mind that nowhere the regulatory constraint should be violated so let's talk about the pozzolana because the first and the most important thing in civil engineering is a pozzolanic material is it not so it's nothing but a volcanic ash from pozzoli in italy this is how the name came pozzolana so this is a naturally occurring volcanic ash and the property is if you add water it hardens the hydration of the material and the counterpart of this in our country is surkhi i think most of you can appreciate this word surkhi is it one is a ash of any material you add little bit of lime upgrade the properties and then it can be used for construction purpose now i would like to draw an interesting parallel here when we talk about natural volcano and man made volcano see this is a natural volcano any guess what would be a man made volcano chimney yes so a power plant all right so these are nothing but they are working almost parallel to each other so here you find lava coming out of the system and then ultimately this lava precipitates cools gets crystallized and so on here whatever is going into the environment will precipitate after some time it will form a top layer of the soil 
whatever remains in the boiler units is nothing but your pulverized fuel ash which normally we call as fly ash and by virtue of its chemical composition this material becomes a pozzolana so i am sure that most of you are aware that fly ash has been used as soil stabilization is it not a lot of laboratory studies have been done to show the properties of the ash where the lime reactivity becomes very important the amount of free lime which is present in the ash is very important so that it stabilizes the soil mass some in situ studies have also been done on pavement bases and the sub bases of the roads i had shown you in the introductory lecture that how this fly ash can be utilized for making pavements and roads what happens basically when you aim for stabilization the whole objective is that swelling pressure and percentage swell of the soil should decrease if you add fly ash so this is the first property which you are looking for when stabilization is talked about that means the swelling pressure of the soil should decrease percentage swelling should decrease its liquid limit plastic limit plasticity index should decrease in other words the system becomes more workable so when you plastic when you modify the plasticity of the material what will happen it can be compacted very easily so this is how stabilization can be achieved just by simply compacting the soil mass or by adding some chemicals additives like fly ash add mixtures like fly ash you can change the plasticity of the material and hence you can achieve better compaction when you are adding fly ash into clays what you are doing you are creating a matrix of the grains where finer modified or getting altered because of interaction with the coarse grains which are present in the fly ash so the compaction increases cbr modification i'm sure when you are adding it to the in situ soils the whole intention is to increase the cbr of the native soil so that the pavements and subbases can be constructed over it fly ash cement mix this is also a lot of people have tried fly ash with cement or with calcium added to the soil mass so this becomes fly ash cement lime mix or whatever this is an interesting scenario where fly ash application is becoming very much mandatory and you know it's growing in indian scenario so application has grown significantly over last 6 to 7 years particularly in the field of cement industry part replacement of cement people are trying to use this material and there is a high level of acceptance among consultants architects and engineers now there is a norm as per is code 456 of 2000 for design and construction of concrete structures you can use fly ash up to 35 percent less than 35 percent up to 35 percent and what's what, what is that you are achieving by using fly ash based or sometimes it's also known as fly ash blended cement is it not so there's a difference between opc and ppc so ordinary portland cement if you add some fly ash into it it becomes a ppc what is ppc yeah so basically you are adding pozzolana to this so it becomes a ppc you can control the rate of setting of the cement you can control the ultimate strength which you are getting out of this sorry yeah durability can be achieved better that's right so the whole idea is to reduce the consumption of opc why the production of opc itself is anti environment is it not emission of lot of carbon dioxide and other gases plus the natural resources you can conserve by adding the fly ash so the whole idea is when you go for blended cement that we want to save energy as far as construction is concerned conservation of resources minerals and less pollution of the environment and degradation of the environment so by reducing consum consumption of opc the rate of depletion of mineral resources required for production of cement can be 
reduce. So this is the beauty of going for fly ash based cement design. There is another concept which is picking up these days is high volume fly ash concrete which is known as HVAC. A good example of this type of construction for infrastructure development would be any idea? The most famous application very recently which has been achieved. Bandavali ceiling, that's right. So Bandavali ceiling is a good example of HVAC where high volume of ash has been used for increasing the durability of the concrete. So the essential attribute of this is that uh, volume of the fly ash which is used in the system should be very high. And you are doing the entire design based on the concept that minimum possible moisture content or the water content. And also we want to reduce the consumption of OPC. So these are the three attributes for designing HVAC, that is high volume fly ash concrete. HVAC corresponds to high volume ash concrete. And we will find most of the applications in power industry, power sector, whether it is hydropower, thermal power or nuclear power, design of domes of the reactor buildings and the shells of the reactor building where HVAC is being preferred these days. Another beauty is you can use up to 50% of the fly ash by compacting it in a specialized manner. So this is where people started talking about self-compacting concrete also. Most of the dams, barrages and irrigation projects are also using this type of concrete. Most of the marine projects where underwater concreting is required, they deal with uh, the HVAC type of a cement. And sometimes the projects which are associated with environmental protection or environmental engineering projects, where you don't want to contaminate the environment much. The reason is fly ash is non leachable in most of the cases. All right. So this helps in creating a matrix where leachability becomes much small. And of course, when you add fly ash, the durability is increasing because the pores which are present in the normal concrete get filled up and the porosity of the system decreases. And coming to the silica fumes, this is also an admixture which is normally added in construction of concrete. By definition, silica fumes are known as silica, micro silica also. The particle sizes will be very, very small. They will be finer than, you know, point not, not 0.02 microns. And this is a byproduct of reduction of high purity quartz with coal in electric furnaces during the production of silica and ferrosilicon alloys. Most of the electronic industry is based on these alloys, is it not? Silicon and ferrosilicon alloys. So the more and more electronic components are produced, the more and more silica fumes are also being created. So silica fume is also collected as a byproduct in the production of other silicon alloys such as ferrochromium, ferromagnese and ferromagnesium and calcium silicon. So these are specialty items and when you produce these systems then silica, produce, silica fumes come out as the industrial waste. Are you aware of uh, something where there is a caution on using silica fumes in concrete? Anything related with silica should be highly corrosive and carcinogenic. All right. So if you are using too much of silica in concrete, what happens? It becomes an antidose. So rather than giving more strength, what it does? It starts having more corrosive effects in the concrete. So typically 5 to 6 percent of silica fume is added in concrete. And when you go for 5 to 6 percent silica, the durability is maximum because these are very fine particles which go and fit into the pores of the concrete which you have created and they seal them. So durability increases if you use silica fume but not more than 5 to 6 percent. Otherwise, 
corrosive action picks up. There is a very interesting concept which comes to my mind here I would like to share with you. Densification of silica fumes is a very big problem. So if you can devise a technique by which you can densify silica fumes, you can become a good industrialist. The specific gravity of these fumes would be 0.6.7. So entire truck load of silica fumes will weigh approximately only few tons. So transportation of silica fumes is a very big problem. So that is where some people try to work on densification of silica fumes. So normally silica fumes are transported in liquid forms. So you put them in water, so at least they achieve the density of water. So this is a sort of a densification, but it is not a very good way of densifying silica film because it starts reacting with water. So its reactivity may get lost during this interaction. This is a very good example of how a product or a material gets or it starts interaction with water and it loses its pozzolanicity. Of course, some studies are required in this direction. Now let us come to the need of recycling and reuse of tyres. In the previous lecture we were talking about this. So apart from being a threat to human health and the environment, in what way? Because a piled up stack of uh, tyres will always produce poisonous gases and hence it will pollute the environment. It is very unsightly scene. You can't appreciate this if rubber tires are lying, you know, next to the your habitat or on the roads or wherever. So they create land pollution also, and water, rainwater gets collected. So this becomes a place for mosquito breeding. So these are the issues which are involved with this. Sometimes they may catch fire, and hence you may have tire fires also it becomes significantly important. So this is where recycling and reuse of tires is becoming very important and geotechnical engineers should take definite interest in this task. So either they are stockpiled or they are landfilled. But then again because of the volume, it is very difficult to put them in a landfill as such. So there has to be some genuine application of used rubber tires. Some of the applications I have shown here for road embankments. So you can stack them one over the other and then you can form embankments out of it. It is a good practice of creating embankments of the lagoons. So you can put a layer of the tires and cover it with the soil cover and this system can act as a embankment of sufficient strength subgrade insulation for roads, wherever you require insulation in the very hot and tropic countries, this is where you can use as a subgrade of the roads. Even in the freeze and thaw type of a road also you can use this. Another interesting application is asphalt over pavement, where you can go for mastic asphalt or shredded rubber tire mixed with the asphalt and you can get the best possible uh, end product in the form of the road. Most of the advanced countries they are following this, of course in India also now this concept is coming. What are the requirements of the payments which uh, should be fulfilled by this material? So durability is very important issue that is flexible and rigid, is it not? How do you define? flexible and rigid payments. That means elastic modulus. So based on the elastic modulus, you can find out which system is going to be more durable. And this is where deformation modulus also comes into the picture. Thermal resistance of the surface, rutting resistance. So it should give you a sort of a feel as if there is no rutting on the roads because of the application of a material which is being used for designing pavements. Wearing, the number of passes you know every day over the surface. So wearing resistance should be very high, shrinkage resistance should be very high. 
and skid resistance should be very very high. So this is where rubber tire with steel mesh meets all the requirements. Simple normal tires which you are using in your automobiles they can be used. What tests you will be doing to obtain these properties when you are mixing this metal? Sorry, abrasion is valid for aggregates. See, for rubber doing abrasion test is not a good idea. Have you seen this? Yeah. First of all, bitumen or asphalt bonding with this material should be a very important test. If you are doing coating of this material on asphalt or you are mixing it with asphalt, so the bond strength should be very good. Then second test which should define its durability. CBR again is normally not done. You have seen these tufts, tufts like your hockey tuff or football tuff, tennis tufts or racing tracks. So there the top layer happens to be a synthetic material. So this is where actually tires can be used for creating a very durable and no deformation, no rut formation pavements. Now thermal resistance is a very big problem. Most of the time what happens in particularly North India where the temperatures go very high during summers. What is the major problem related to roads? It basically melts and skidding or most of the accidents are because of this process. So elevated temperature, the stability of the asphalt becomes a very big issue. So if you want to increase the thermal resistance, mixing shredded rubber tires in asphalt seems to be a very good idea. And that is why you say that skid resistance gets decreased. Similarly, shrinkage gets decreased. The wearing course definitely, wearing will be very less because of material which is mostly elastic in nature. So this type of cross sections can be you know, used at places where close to the signals, where traffic come and apply brakes. So most of the time you will find in cities that close to the signal, the roads are always in very poor shape. Otherwise, the entire stretch is good. So, in Bombay city, what they have done? They have used a lot of paver blocks close to the signals. Why it is so? Because the interlocking is very good and they give added resistance to the braking phenomena. So, most of the time, vehicles will come very close to the signal and then you apply brake, and that is the place where most of the wearing process goes on onto the surface. So if you want to stop this process, this type of technology is very good. But the biggest difficulty is that amalgamation of asphalt with shredded rubber tire requires a lot of understanding of the material and a controlled process. So it has to be at a certain temperature and the bonding between the two is should be very good. It should not peel off. It should be the paving surface. Paving surface. So you can change the thickness of that crust and you can maintain a pavement of a required quality. So it gives you basically a cushion effect, more impinging effect on the surface. The best example is your uh, tracks used for uh, racing or automobile testing. See these type of technology should be developed in house and there should be some research associated with this. Now, have you heard of falling weight deflectometer? In your transportation engineering courses, you must have been taught about falling weight deflectometer. If you apply common sense, what does this mean? Falling weight deflectometer. Deflection of pavement. That's right. So, particularly this test is done for air strips. Why? That's right. So the whole jumbo jet lands on the airstrip, you know. So the airstrip should be so strong, it should not deform. Otherwise, what is going to happen? <laughs> so this is where a lot of research is required. Impact resistance of the 
payments and the turfs which you are creating. Most of the time military people do this type of tests. Are you aware of or no? Whenever you design a airstrip, the quality of the airstrip is checked by doing this test. The deflection should be minimal when you drop a weights from a certain height. It's just like your SPT test. So this is a very good subject on which people can do a lot of work. The design of the mix, design of the mix which is more durable, deformations are less, thermal resistance, a lot of science is required here, a lot of engineering is required here, a lot of understanding is required here. I have used the word here and nobody asked me that what is meant by shrinkage resistance. So let me ask you guys now, where do you find shrinkage resistance or shrinkage occurring on pavements? There's something known as shrinkage cracking of the rigid pavements. Sorry, concrete pavements. Yes, why? Why it happens? And how to stop it? You are right. So, what is the best way of stopping shrinkage cracks? Double bars. That's right. So, there comes the concept of double bars. So, if you use double bars, then shrinkage cracks can be stopped. So, it's basically because of thermal incompatibility of the material when it comes in contact with ambience. So, temperatures are very high and then in between there is a concrete pavement and below that again there is a ground surface. So, there is a big temperature difference. So, this may cause also wrapping stresses or sometimes we call them warping stresses. So, shrinkage resistance becomes very important in case of designing the system when you are using from rubber tires. Alright? So, this is a typical tire. This part of the slides I have taken from Professor R.C. Joshi's presentation. I got impressed with what he presented. He's, he visited us 5-7 uh, years back, I think, from University of Calgary, Canada. This found the industry based on this technology, but I do not think it was done. So, you take a tire and then splice it from the side walls. So, this is how the marks are. You can cut the rubber tire like this. Okay. So, this is how it becomes. And then straighten it. So, one rubber tire, after splicing it and straightening it, it becomes a sheet. Clear? Approximately 1 meter. Now, you think of using these sheets with the help of some, you know, rivets or bolts to create a cushion out of it. So, how this will be done? This will show you. On y axis, this is the width of the pavement, the amount of width which you require and on the x axis is the longitudinal direction of the pavement. So, here comes your first layer of the tires, alright, spliced and straightened tires. So, you just lay them like this, then what do you have to do? You have to bolt them to the formation. So, the first layer is ready. On this, you go for the secondary bolting, clear, followed by again riveting and so on. So, ultimately this leads to a formation of a thick pad which can be used as a cushion or a pavement on the top of the rigid basis. So, this technique people have used, they have created some tracks out of it. This will be low cost first of all, quite durable and the third thing is you are using the tires which are lying in plenty and there is no other application of these tires. So, this is the way you can keep on increasing the height of the cross section or the entire pavement which you are designing. Whenever you get time, try to adopt this technology and do some study on this. So, so on. Alright. So, let us talk about now beneficial use of glass aggregates. 
So, glass aggregates are nothing but uh, you collect most of the glass either in the form of the bottle or the packing material, crush it and the heap of the crushed uh, glass will look like this. It is nothing but shining sand particles. So, once you have converted glass into this type of a structure, you can utilize it the way you want. So, these are the applications. The first is construction aggregates. There is a big scarcity of construction aggregates in every city now. And the problem is from where to get the best possible aggregate. So, as I said in the previous lecture, the beauty of this material is that this is a crushed glass and glass is nothing but a form of silica. And we do not want reactive silica all the time in our construction, particularly when you are filling it, using it as a backfill on beaches and so on. Okay? So, if you go through the applications of crushed glass aggregates, the first one which is gaining a lot of attention of people is construction aggregates. For all these applications, nowadays we require people who are, you know, dealers, vendors and entrepreneurs. So, you can adopt this type of business if you are interested. The first one is fill aggregates. You require aggregates for filling somewhere in the backfills particularly. You should appreciate the point that soil is becoming very, very scarce everywhere. And the amount of glass which is being generated in the present day society by everybody is tremendous. So, you just have to have a crushing unit, people to collect the glass, crush it, collect it and supply it. So, very low cost industry, but I think profits will be maximum. Try this out. The another one is filter media. There is a problem in getting good filter medium or the material. Good aggregates are not available. Good sand is not available in most of the part of the city by the way, in Bombay city. Of course, this glass cannot be used as a replacement for sand or which you are using from river because of less reactivity. But you can alter the properties of this glass by giving it some treatment. Pulverize it and after pulverizing this glass will become more amorphous, not crystalline. So, a crystalline phase is less reactive while an amorphous phase which is more powdered is more reactive. A simple example of this philosophy would be given a chance would you like to add sugar crystal in your cup of tea or sugar powder into a cup of tea. So, why? Because powder is always more reactive. The reason is finer the grain more the surface area and more the surface area more reactivity. So, what you are doing is if you crush this glass to a grade where the entire glass becomes powder, chances are that this glass may have more glassy phase. So, this is the term which is normally used by people who are involved with you know research in construction materials and I will talk about this phase slightly later when we discuss how to characterize materials. And particularly if you do XRF analysis, then it becomes very easy to identify what is the glassy phase of the material which is going to be reactive. So, in filter media people can use it quite easily. Some specialty uses particularly in pharmaceutical companies where these type of materials can be used. Glass fault. Have you heard of this name glass fault? You are always hearing asphalt. Now, asphalt itself is because of what is the source of asphalt? It is a natural material or it is a it is a petroleum product that is right. So, this is also quite scarce. So, rather than using asphalt, people can go for mixture of glass and asphalt. So, this becomes glass fault. So, it again does this what we have discussed in the previous when we are talking about uh, shredded tires and their application in asphalt and in tarmac lot of value added products can be made out of it, fused glass. Now, this is what I have been discussing when we talk about fused glass, basically you are altering the properties of the crystalline glass by giving it some physico chemical mineralogical treatment or just by crushing it simply, it becomes very active at elevated temperature. 
So you can melt the entire glass and then you can create a sort of a fused glass which is going to be more reactive. Art glasses, different type of glasses which are required for art work. Terrazzo composites. What is terrazzo? Have you heard of terracotta? So terracotta is nothing but a product from clay. So soil is also very scarce. Remember these things. All natural resources are very, very scarce these days. Nobody is going to allow you to touch them. So this is where you can use these type of composites for decoration purpose and so on. Foam blocks. Paper blocks, brick blocks, where you use them as a filler material. Rather than using sand and other aggregates. Another interesting subject on which some people are working is hydroponics. What is hydroponics? This is growing plants without soil. Have you seen in some hotels where they use a lot of pebbles, gels for creating plants? Yes, so this is one example. What is the reason? I have given you some logic just five minutes back. Silica is a very, very active material. So wherever you have silica, it allows growth of microbes. And those microbes, on these microbes actually, plants will survive. So it's a good example of how, how these plants can be grown without using soil. Different type of bottle cleaning programs where you can use this material as abrasive value will be very high of this material. So you can make a slurry and you can use it for washing purpose. Not for dish, uh, dish washing because of the abrasive effect your dishes will get spoiled. The way people are looking at it is it's an industrial mineral basically. So mineral which is created by human activities. It has abrasive properties, short blast media and in as a filler in most of the materials, scrubbers particularly. There are some specialized applications as fill aggregates in road bases, trenches, filter media, on-site water system, drinking water filtration. Earlier they used to use sand for drinking water supply and filtration. Beach sand is a good example. Most of the cities want good clean sand, is it not? So these glass particles will be very shining during day time. It gives a very good feeling as if you are walking on a very neat and clean beach. Drainage aggregates because of their size and because of their stability and durability. They don't get disintegrated so easily. Some type of media and of course decorative and landscape purpose and so on. I have talked about uh, gas fault and tarmac. These are nothing but bitumen paving matrix where you can use this system. In your opinion, bitumen is a natural material or is a man-made material? So how seems to be divided? You should think over it sometimes because you are using so much of bitumen, is it not? The more and more industrialization, more population, growth, everywhere you require top capping of the roads, payments. It's basically a natural product and that is why it's becoming very scarce. Yes, it's, it's a natural product. That is one of the ways of extracting bitumen. But most of the bitumen comes out of the natural formations. I think geologists can tell you better. Coal, coal beds. It's a form of coal. This is also becoming very scarce. So everything actually what we are doing in Selenium right now is under threat from environmental scarcity. Well, just to give you an idea about the dredge material because dredging is becoming a very important activity in geotechnical engineering these days. This is a typical dredger which I have shown here. Which is used normally for mega projects and this is the end product. You can do the complete beach nourishment or creation of the beach by using this process. You know what is this process known as? 
What is going on here? Can you guess? Sand has been sprayed or sprayed over. Sand has been sprayed over. That's right. Somewhere you will see here that lot of sand is being dumped already. Do you know where this project was done in the country, in our country? Paradeep. Paradeep is the place where this type of beach was created. You know, Paradeep Port Trust with the help of EIL and Boscalis of Netherlands. They have done this project. It's a beautiful project. Now this technique is known as rainbow technique. So what dredger does? It is in the sea. It sucks dredged material or the geomaterial from the bottom and then pumps it out on the shore. Very simple technique. But unfortunately, this has become only a practice. Not much of research has been done in this area. Because you talk to any of these companies, they will simply say that we have been doing this for last so many years without studying you know, the material property, how it should be. There is a lot of science and technology behind this. So this is how the geotechnics of dredging is evolving as a very new subject in environmental geotechnology. Now, what is your opinion? Once you are creating this type of a system, all right, in nature, what is going to happen? So then you should ask me a question that why dredging is done. So sometimes dredging is a capital dredging and sometimes it is maintenance dredging. So when you are maintaining your channels, then you have to suck out the material, throw it out. But when you are doing capital dredging, the whole intention is to create something. Now my question was that once you have created these type of islands, what is happening to the ecology? The answer is, not really earthquakes, the answer is the entire ecosystem is getting affected. How? You have created a land out of a water body. So all hydrogeological properties are going to get changed. Clear? And how about the aquatic life? Aquatic life gets affected. So there are environmentalists these days, you know, they don't allow you to go ahead with these projects because of this simple reason. And of course, if your sediments are contaminated, which you are lifting from the seashore and then you are dumping close to the habitat. So the implications are tremendous. So you can't just take out something and dump it very close to where you stay. All right. So this is how these issues are becoming very, very important in geotechnical engineering. And I hope you will agree that these type of studies require too much intricate Correct. Unless you understand what you are lifting from the ocean bed, you can visit these websites to see. Of course, they will not give you much details, but uh, at least some information you may get. There could be a situation where rocks are very close or there could be a situation where only clay is present. So when you are dredge doing dredging in the rocky medium, the biggest problem is how to cut the rocks, how to lift them and how to make a slurry and throw it out. So this is where a new concept comes in geotechnical engineering which is known as rheological properties of geomaterials. Truly speaking, people associated with engine oil and oil industry, they used to talk about this earlier, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers. But nowadays, the need is that we should also understand how to form a slurry of geomaterials which can be pumped onto the shore. So depending upon the dredger capacity, this point to this point could be few kilometers even because the chances that you may get the good material very close to the shoreline are very remote. So you can't stop your activity just by saying that I can't dispose it off on the shore. could be few kilometers down and then you may have to lift this material and dispose it off. So the issue is design of pumps, design of slurry, what type of sediments you are lifting from the ocean bed, how far they will go. They all are under the auspices of geotechnical engineering these days. So this is known as rainbow technique of creating beaches. I hope you have got better idea now. So what are the beneficial uses of the dredge material? The first is beach nourishment. Whenever soil or the sand depletes on the beach, you take out the material and nourish the beach, so that the beaches look more beautiful, healthy. 
sure protection. Otherwise, erosion may take place. So, if you want to stop this process, you may have to lift the material from the seabed and dump it on the seashore. Soil creation enhancement. The marine sediments are supposed to have more microorganisms or biological organisms in there, is it not? So, when you put them on this onshore, the enhancement of the soil properties can take place. Land reclamation, this we have been talking a lot. Habitat restoration, sometimes dredging is done to create more habitat for aquatic life, aquaculture. Coastal Andhra Pradesh, I think this is a good example of how they do you know aquaculture. Is this correct? So, for habitat restoration, sometimes dredging is done. Use of construction materials, particularly countries which are surrounded by sea only. So, from where they will bring construction materials. So, this becomes a good source. Otherwise, also you must have noticed from the rivers and the sea, normally sand is dredged out. In Bombay, this is a big business and even in small towns, you can dredge out sand for construction purpose.